Uh, during 2024, Keith mentioned last week that we wanted to spend a little bit more of intentional time throughout the year focusing uh, our minds and our hearts on communion, on the Lord's Supper. Um, it's our practice here at Fairlawn that we take the Lord's Supper once a month on the first Sunday. And so we thought that a good way to start out this year would be to uh, take the whole Sunday and really gear it around the Lord's Supper. Um, but there's really uh, two ways that we want to encourage you this year to grow in your understanding of the Supper and therefore of your appreciation of Christ as we partake in it. Uh, the first way is by using this little family worship guide, which if you didn't pick up on your way in, you can pick up on the way out. Um, Abby and I use this guide uh, to help teach our children what the Lord's Supper is all about and what happens when they see us take it. Um, it's more though than just a guide for parents to teach their children. I think it's also very helpful for any of you as believers to expand your understanding of the supper and to help it become more significant and meaningful to you as you partake of it. Uh, and one of the things that um, this guide I think is, is, uh, helps with is personal preparation to come to the table. Um, the personal repentance and preparation that we have when we come to the table should start before we get to church on Sunday morning, that Sunday morning. Um, and so this uh, guide has some good self-examination questions that you can ask yourself and be praying through as you prepare to come to the table that Sunday. Um, we often use it the week before communion Sundays and just walk through it the week prior to help um, anchor our hearts in, in what it's all about. So I commend that to you to use throughout this year. And then uh, we'll also be taking two or three Sundays throughout the year, and as we said, organizing it all around communion, where we'll have a sermon that is preached on the supper and orienting our songs and things like that around uh, the supper as well. Now, there's two kinds of sermons that we're going to strive to preach on these Sundays. The first kind of sermon is what I call a nuts and bolts sermon, and that is looking at the basics of the Lord's Supper, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? What happens when we take the supper together, etc.? cetera? Um, that's gonna be the first kind of sermon. And then the second kind of sermon that we wanna preach on these Sundays is uh, a sermon that helps really stir up our hearts to want to come and partake of the supper. So it's gonna be a sermon probably geared around the death of Christ, <laughs> which makes sense. And uh, that's really just wooing our souls and our hearts to come to the table with joy. And it's my aim this morning to preach this second kind of sermon. And my prayer throughout this week has been that it would make you long to come to the table this morning. So as we, as we take up this topic of communion, the Lord's Supper, I wanna focus our attention on the imagery that scripture uses of a cup of wine and how that cup of wine is connected to God's judgment, the death of Christ, and our blessing. So those three things we're gonna look at this morning, how this imagery of a cup of wine is connected to God's judgment, Christ's death, and our blessing. And as a way of just uh, helping us get in the right frame of mind, I'm gonna read from 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 25. And I do love when we stand for the reading of God's word. So if you can, please do so with me. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 25. This is the word of the Lord. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you for your word to us this morning. We pray that as we study this imagery of the cup, that you would stir up and enliven the affections of our hearts to want to partake of this supper in a worthy way and that you might bless us through it. 
We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Kids, we love that you're in here with us. Uh, We believe that God wants to speak to you through the preaching of his word. Uh, And so to help you focus, I have a word tracker for you this morning. So get out a pen, a piece of paper, write the word cup. Cup, C-U-P, at the top of that paper. And then you can put a tally mark for every time I say it. And I have a feeling it's gonna be a lot. So keep your hands ready. So I wanna begin by first looking at how scripture links a cup of wine with the judgment of God. And it does this all throughout the scriptures. And so what I wanna do is just read a few scriptures to kind of give you a sight into the way that scripture makes this connection, give you a little survey of some scriptures that do this. So first, Psalm 75, verses seven and eight says, It is God who executes judgment, putting down one and lifting up another. For in the hand of the Lord, there is a cup with foaming wine, well mixed, and he pours out from it, and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. Psalm 11, six says, let him that is the Lord rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. Isaiah 51, 17, wake yourself, wake yourself, stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, who have drunk to the dregs the bowl, the cup of staggering. And then Revelation 16, 19 says, the great city was split into three parts and the cities of the nations fell, and God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. So this is just some of the scriptures uh, throughout the Bible that make this connection for us between this cup of wine that is filled with the judgment and wrath of God for the wicked. Now, Jeremiah 25 contains the largest portion in scripture that is devoted to developing this connection between God's wrath and the cup. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn with me to Jeremiah 25. We're gonna spend a little bit of time here. The passage begins in verse 15 of Jeremiah 25 and goes all the way through verse 38. Now what I wanna do here is um, I want the text itself to really uh, rest on you. So I'm just going to read some portions of this passage, make a few small comments, uh, but my preference here is that the, the word would speak for itself in what it says. So let's begin with verses 15 through 17 of Jeremiah 25. Listen again to the connection between the cup and judgment. Thus the Lord, the God of Israel said to me, take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. They shall drink and stagger and be crazed because of the sword that I am sending among them. So I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations to whom the Lord sent me drink it. So the picture that we see here is of God's judgment being poured out on the nations like wine being poured out of a cup on all those nations who have rebelled against him. And Jeremiah here is the agent who is going to pour out that cup of wrath on the nations as the prophet of the Lord. And then in verses 18 through 26, it details all of the nations that the Lord will judge in great detail. And here's a summary of some of those nations. Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, Egypt, the land of Uz and the Philistines, Edom, Moab, Amnon, Tyre, Sidon, the kings of the coastlands across the sea, Arabia, and on and on it goes. And then in verse 26, it summarizes this section by saying, one after another, 
and all the kingdoms of the world that are on the face of the earth. So the picture we get here is of this comprehensive judgment of God that is going to be poured out on all of the wicked in the world. And then God tells us in verses 27 through 29 that no one who deserves this cup of wrath will be able to escape it. Then you shall say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, drink and be drunk and vomit, fall and rise no more because of the sword that I am sending among you. And if they refuse to accept the cup from your hand to drink, then you shall say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, you must drink. For behold, I begin to work disaster at the city that is called by my name, and shall you go unpunished? You shall not go unpunished, for I am summoning a sword against all the inhabitants of the earth, declares the Lord of hosts. God emphasizes here that this wrath that is going to be poured out is not optional for the wicked. He says that you must drink. For all those whom God sends his wrath and judgment, it is an escapable death sentence. And then Jeremiah concludes this passage on the cup of God's wrath by describing the judgment that will take place when it is poured out. Jeremiah 25 verses 32 through 38. Thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, disaster is going forth from nation to nation and a great tempest is stirring from the furthest parts of the earth and those pierced by the Lord on that day shall extend from one end of the earth to the other. And they shall not be lamented or gathered or buried. They shall be dung on the surface of the ground. Wail, you shepherds, and cry out and roll in ashes, you lords of the flock. For the days of your slaughter and dispersion have come, and you shall fall like a choice vessel. No refuge will remain for the shepherds, nor escape for the lords of the flock. A voice, the cry of the shepherds, and the wail of the lords of the flock. For the Lord is laying waste their pasture, and the peaceful folds are devastated because of the fierce anger of the Lord. Like a lion that has left his lair, for their land has become a waste because of the sword of the oppressor and because of his fierce anger anger. God describes the pouring out of his wrath in physical terms as bringing complete destruction. Disaster is going forth from nation to nation. The Lord will pierce his enemies. No one will mourn for them. They will not be buried, but they will lie on the ground like dung. The Lord comes to slaughter the wicked and he will execute his fierce anger like a lion that has been released from his lair. Revelation 14 adds to this description from Jeremiah in verses nine through 11. And another angel, a third, followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image." When the cup of the Lord's anger is poured out on the wicked, they will be tormented with fire and sulfur and their torment will never end. They will find no rest from the wrath of God. Now, brothers and sisters, I understand that this feels heavy because it is heavy. The wrath of God 
is a terrifying reality. And it is stored up for every person who rebels against God by rejecting Christ. It will not be refusable for the unbeliever and it will lead to their eternal punishment and torment. The reason why I wanted to set this background for you and show this connection between the cup and God's wrath is because it illumines for us the passage we're going to turn to next. It illumines for us the death of Christ. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26. Matthew 26, verses 36 through 42. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to his disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I... Drink it, your will be done. Have you ever read this passage and thought to yourself, why is Jesus talking about a cup? Why does he want to forego drinking it or asking that he could forego drinking it? What is in this cup? What is this all about? Well, if you've been paying attention, you already have the answers to these questions. The cup that Jesus had to drink was the cup of God's wrath that we just saw throughout the scriptures. The cup was filled with the disaster that the wicked deserve. The cup was filled with the piercing and slaughtering judgment of God. The cup was filled with the torments of hell. It was foaming with the fierce anger of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, this is what scripture teaches us the cross entailed for Jesus. In the garden the night before his death, he prays with the depth of sorrow that would have killed any other man that he might forego, if possible, the drinking of this cup of wrath. And the cup of God's wrath is shown to us in both physical and the spiritual torment that Jesus endured on the cross. Charles Spurgeon, I think, captures this well. He says, there was the cup. Hell was in it. The Savior drained it till there was not a drop left for any of his people. The great ten-thronged whip of the law was worn out upon his back. There is no lash left with which to smite one for whom Jesus died. The great fury of God's justice has exhausted all of its ammunition. There is nothing left to be hurled against the child of God. The wrath of God was so completely poured out on Jesus that not a drop remains for us brothers and sisters. 
In the next chapter, Matthew describes the effects caused by God pouring out the cup of wrath on Jesus. Turn over a page to Matthew 27, verses 45 through 51. At this point, Jesus has been hanging on the cross for some time, and verse 45 says, Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. As Jesus is hanging on the cross, he offers up a cry of forsakenness revealing to us the effect of God's wrath upon him. The great hymn, How Deep the Father's Love for Us, I think captures this well when it says, how great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away. But not only this, but also before and after Jesus' death, we see the effect of this pouring out of God's wrath on creation. Verse 45 says, now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And then in verse 51 it says, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. It's as if creation itself is feeling the weight of this moment when the wrath of God is poured out on Jesus. It was a moment of deep darkness as the sun was swallowed up for three hours at midday. It was a moment of intense judgment as the earth shook and the rocks were split. Brothers and sisters, this is what it looked like for the cup of God's wrath to be poured out on Jesus. The cup of wrath that overflowed with the judgment of God was completely consumed by Christ on the cross. He took the cup that we deserved and he drank it completely. And because he has done this, he is able to give to us a cup of blessing. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 16. Paul says, The cup of blessing that we bless Is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Paul calls the cup that we drink, quite astonishingly based on what we've already seen, not a cup of wrath, but a cup of blessing. And it is a blessing in that it reminds us of the cup of wrath that Jesus drank for us. It reminds us of all of the salvation blessings that Christ purchased for us through his blood and that by faith are now ours. But it is also a cup of blessing because through receiving it in faith, we commune with Christ and he enriches, strengthens, and nourishes our faith. This communion with Christ, this blessing of communion with Christ is what Paul is getting at when he poses the question, is not this cup of blessing a participation 
in the blood of Christ. The Greek word that is translated here as participation in this verse is koinonia. Koinonia is often translated as fellowship or communion and is used in scripture to describe the spiritual fellowship and relationship that we have with Christ. So what Paul is telling us here is that the one who comes to the table in true faith experiences the blessing of special fellowship and communion with Christ. And that's part of why this cup is now a blessing for us. So what we have seen here is a beautiful transformation and shift from this cup of wrath that was being stored up for us as unbelievers, that Christ has drunk. And now as believers, he offers to us and calls us to come and partake, not of the cup of wrath, but of the cup of blessing. Christ drank the cup of God's wrath so that we could drink the cup of his blessing. He drank the cup of God's anger so that we could drink the cup of God's delight. Christ drank the cup of God's hatred so that we could drink the cup of his love. This is how Christ has transformed this cup. He drank the cup of forsakenness so that we could drink the cup of his presence. Christ drank the cup of guilt and shame so that we could drink the cup of forgiveness and acceptance. Christ drank the cup of hell so that we could drink the cup of heaven. Brothers and sisters, this is what the Lord's Supper is intended to do. It is to bring us face to face with the cup of wrath that we deserved and the cup of blessing that we have now been given through Christ's death. And it is the way that Christ regularly reminds us of this reality and allows us to experience more of the blessings that flow from it. As we move toward partaking of the supper together, there's two things that I wanna press in on in light of what we've seen here. And the first I would like to address to those of you here who uh, do not believe in Jesus. First, as a pastor here, I just want to say thank you for being here this morning. Uh, I'm glad that you are here. And I want to say that I understand that what I'm about to say may sound judgmental, rude, and even cold to you, but I want you to understand that it comes from a heart of love and concern for your soul. If you sit here today and are rejecting the death of Christ, rejecting the gospel, then the cup of God's wrath that we saw earlier is being filled up for you. Every offense against God, every breaking of his law, every sinful desire, thought, word, or action is another drop in that cup of wrath that Romans says is being stored up for those who do not believe. And if you go to your grave rejecting Jesus, the cup of wrath that he drank will one day be poured out on you for eternity, which is what we saw in Revelation 14. Apart from faith in Christ, there is no blessing for you in this meal that we're going to share as a church in a moment. And if you choose to take it, scripture says that it will only increase the judgment that is awaiting you. But friends, I want to encourage you. The cup that maybe you're holding in your hand right now speaks a message to you of what Christ has done for all those who trust in him. It speaks a message of salvation from the wrath of God and of the blessing of life 
with Christ now and forever. That's what this cup means to us who are here who believe. It speaks about the deliverance that we have, the forgiveness of sins that we have through Christ. And dear friends, it can be that for you today as well. So my encouragement to you is to let the sight of this cup lead you to flee from the wrath to come and to cling to Christ by faith, trusting in him, believing that his death has paid for your sins. And now for my brothers and sisters in Christ. When we look at the cup, we ought to see in it the wrath that we deserved and the wrath that God poured out on Jesus for us. We ought to see the shame, guilt, pain, torment, and punishment that our sins deserved. But because of what Jesus has done, this cup no longer represents wrath, but it represents the blessings that are ours by faith in Christ. Seeing what Jesus has done, brothers and sisters, should make us all the more eager to turn away from our sin and to come to this meal in true repentance and faith. Turning away from the sin that put Jesus on the cross and partaking in a way that honors and glorifies him.